All right, so let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Good afternoon, David. Uh, my name is Claudia. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the Susan Fairfax City. We're very humble and grateful that uh, David Misani accepted our invitation to our show. David, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Claudia. Nice to meet you. Good here, man. We, you know, we've been having living for the last two years with with COVID. Some people believe in the vaccine. Some people don't. It affected millions of people all over the world. And I want to know if you, you know, if you were affected or, you know, if any of the family member were affected. Uh, if you're a touring musician, you cannot do work. So people were staying at home for some people where it was a productive period for other world. And uh, how you called it up? And, yeah, I, I, uh, it's, it's been a, it's a, very, it's a very strange time, that's for sure. Um, I do know a few people that that passed away from it. Um, it didn't, hasn't really impacted me or my family at all. Um, ironically, I had planned uh, to lock myself away during the year 2020, uh, coincidentally because uh, in, in 2019, we had traveled all over the world filming all these different concerts with Alan Parsons and with Justin Hayward. And so I had a lot of work back, you know, a backlog of work that I was going to have to do editing these concert movies together. And the only way I could do it was be if I just sort of locked myself away in, in my production facility at my house. I have a state-of-the-art thing where I can do um, editing and recording and everything here uh, and um so i had planned to stay home anyway <laughs> for uh a, a, about a year and uh get all these concert films done and and then the actual uh, right. pandemic hits so it didn't really affect me too much um in fact i ended up getting a lot busier because a lot of bands were no longer able to tour so they were requesting uh, virtual uh, internet type uh, musical projects that we could uh, record and broadcast over the internet during the time when they couldn't tour. So um, I actually got more work during this time. Um, yeah. it, but it was, uh, it, it's been a, it's been quite a, an ordeal I know for a lot of people, very serious uh, illnesses and, and it, it's difficult for people to deal with this. Yeah, yeah, it's too bad, man. Very, very lucky to be alive to begin with, you know. And uh, oh, yeah. for me, as I mentioned before, it was a way to look what was important to me. I was, I'm a, I'm a computer scientist. That's my day job, and I, yeah. I do this for fun. And um, I was going very fast in my life, you know, doing a lot of stuff that wasn't happy, but I wasn't thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, I thought, well, well, I may die next week or whatever, you know. So I better start doing the stuff that I was that I really like. That uh, music is has always been my passion. I have a huge music collection about between CDs and vinyl, Blu-ray over the, over seven thousand. Wow, got three wow. floors of music. One is there that right. what I do with the but there. My my wife always complained that you know I need to start. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't buy more music. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I thought I put the radio together and then I began calling people and uh, it had been great for me, a great experience. I never thought I would be able to get a whole of people like yourself or people from Genesis, people from Toto and many electronic musician guys or girls. So I'm, I'm very, very fortunate you know, that I've been able to do it. On the other hand, I, I slowed down my life a lot, like they say here in the United States, to spell the roses, you know. And yeah. It, you know, seeing how beautiful it is to be alive and yeah, yes. and they were doing to have a good family, they have a good job, a good income, I have done well in my life, you know, and uh, so it's it's beautiful to not not many people are able to do the thing that that we love that, that they love. I know that's true. You know, and, um, so it's, it's 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 terrible for some people. Where are you born? Let's go back to the beginning. Were you born like in a in a musical family? How old were you when you perhaps? had an inclination to take piano lesson or guitar lesson. How music came into your life? You know, I don't really know. No, I did not come from a musical family at all. My dad was a naval captain. Um, and for some weird reason, I just begged them to take piano lessons when I was five years old. Yeah. And I just, I pestered them, apparently. I don't, I don't know why. But they, yeah, I started classical piano training when I was five. 
and um, which greatly influenced my my taste in music. Yeah. Um, uh, this was at the time when the um, when the Beatles were happening here in America, and um, I I just sort of developed a a taste for more complex, more symphonic type music based on my classical training. And so uh, it was it was a very uh, interesting time discovering music uh, mm -hmm. during that period. And you became, when I read about your interview, you, about your biography, you became very, very proficient. So at the time, I think uh, you were 15, 16, you could have gone professional, right? And yeah. Then maybe all the stuff you did after that, like film production or film scoring and progressive stuff, they perhaps could have happened. So it, in a way, was a turn in your life. I don't know, for the better or for the worse, depending on your point of view, but uh, it allowed you to do a lot of more stuff, you know, so. Well, it, yeah, it, it was, a you know, um, I, yeah, I was asked to become professional when I was 15. And I, I frankly, I, I didn't really want to practice four hours a day, you know, which I would have had to have done. And really, you know, I wanted to play baseball and be with my friends and things. <laughs> and uh, it, it was, it would have been a big commitment on my part. And the other thing was, I wasn't, I, I was kind of confused about music. I was, um, on the one hand, I was, I could play Bach, Beethoven, Chopin very proficiently, but I enjoyed rock music, um, which I, I knew uh, intellectually was a little bit, not quite as artistic, maybe, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, these classical pieces I was playing were very complex compared to some of the uh, songs that were on the radio, popular music. And um, and so I, I, I kind of felt a little dissatisfied with a lot of the popular music. I, I always wanted to be a little bit more, I wanted to integrate classical and rock, which at the time hadn't really been done yet, or at least I wasn't aware of it yet. Uh, but then pretty soon people started doing it. And, I, and that's when I kind of got interested in music. But to answer your question, I, I was actually, um, I was also making little, little movies at the time with, you know, my little Super 8 camera. And uh, I, I found I, I love that just as much as music, maybe even a little bit more. And um, I decided to make a filmmaking a career, which <laughs> which turned out to be the right choice for me because... I've had no problem at all making a living working in the film industry. Whereas I've seen a lot of musicians kind of struggle to make a living in the music business. Uh, at the time, so you were 17, 18 years old, you finished high school. Was any pressure for your family? Well, forget about the music, you're not going to make any money. Forget about the film, go to medical school, become a lawyer, whatever. That's where oh, the yeah. action is. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, they were not. Well, I, I can't say they weren't supportive. They were supportive, but they they were probably a little disappointed that I I would have pursued either one of those things. Music and film wasn't quite uh, the profession that I don't think that they wanted me to. My parents wanted me to do, but uh, it it I, I I thought at the time I really wrestled with it. I thought maybe I should get a a normal job and just keep these as as hobbies. But then I thought, you know what? We're only here once. Why not just do the very thing that you love, you know? And uh, I've been blessed and lucky beyond, mm. you know, my wildest dreams. Yeah, in life, sometimes I think uh, you need to do what your inner self tell you to. I mean, for yeah. me, in my opinion, right? right? One day I want to be 85 years old, hopefully, and look back in my life and, and say to myself, man, I did exactly what I wanted to do. I interviewed right. everybody in town. This is comfort, and I, I have a beer with... Eric Clapton, when he was 18 in a bar in London or, or whatever, or seeing a concert or whatever. So yeah. it, it, it's important to do the stuff you like. I mean, it's uh, it's foolish that people, you know, become someone else's life, you know, someone else. Uh, right. With or someone else, you know, method or whatever they do, you know, great. So. Right, exactly. And I, I've been even even more fortunate in that a lot of the people that I loved, uh, admired growing up musically, yeah. are the very people I'm working with now. That I mean, the, the chances of that, who would have thought that that was oh, possible? Absolutely. What kind of music when you were 17, I think, what, 
with stuff with bands were you listening to rock bands? well the first the, the first one i discovered uh was the moody blues oh. I, I i i didn't hear a lot of their i came kind of late to them uh they were a little bit before my time but i uh, I caught them right at the end of their classic period. So Seventh Sojourn was the very first album I ever bought as a kid myself, you know, with my own money. And because I'd, I'd heard this song on the radio called uh, Land of Make Believe <laughs> off of that album that sounded unlike anything I'd heard. I'd never heard anything sound like that before. It had flutes. It had uh, th this really distorted guitar. It had some really beautiful melodies and vocals and these really weird sounding strings which i later learned came from a keyboard called a mellotron and i just hadn't heard anything like that before and it just it really it sort of grabbed me and that's what inspired me to really investigate uh progressive rock music and actually and, and eventually go into recording my own music yeah and that was before the internet so you could look that up or do right. something an app on your phone to say, who is this guy? With so I'm quite sure you you end up calling the radio and oh, yes, and who know. was that? I called, I actually called the, the radio guy? station. You know, you played yeah. this song <laughs> a couple of minutes ago, you know. Can you tell me the name? So you write it down and try to get the album. You know, go to a cassette or the vinyl. You know, go to a record store and that's what I did. I I, I called up the radio station. I said, who was that? What was that? They, they gave yeah. me the name. And the next day, I went out and bought the vinyl. Yeah. So, so before we go to this, so what kind of film I what it, it was any particular director you were following at the time or you were going with your friends or with your parents to the local theater to see, you know, I don't know, uh, Peter Weir or Bergman? What kind of, what, 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 what portion of films were you interested in and why films? Uh, I, you know, I, I just kind of liked making the films when I was a kid. I started when I was 11 making films so I didn't I was just kind of goofing around with it and and then eventually when I started to get serious about it I started uh going to films you know Steven Spielberg films and that that sort of thing and really began to study it and, and figure out how to to um how the how the whole film industry works in terms of making films and all the post-production and everything yeah. and uh so um w one of the things I like about films is that there's so many different aspects to it there's writing directing producing editing lighting you know scoring um acting there's everything and it's just it's just a wonderful process for me i'm a, I'm a fan of uh soundtracks i i have well of course mm -hmm. i have a lot of movies but uh there's so many soundtracks that i like the music never seen the film and vice versa it's, yeah, I have seen many great films that the music is terrible, and right. something in between, you know. So it's 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 a it's a beautiful way to explore movies. Yeah, I, I like science fiction, kind of uh, horror movies in a way, where because I'm a fan of have a big collection of electronic music. So mm -hmm. when there's a scene where they play keyboards, you know, Mellotron or you know, uh, weird stuff, and uh, I'm, I'm fascinated with that. You know, I my first three record that I bought in my life. I think they were, I was 16 or so at the time. It was a Pandethini one, a Giallo Ponti, and a, and a Tangerine Dream. Yeah, yeah. I go, I grew up in a family where music was important. My dad had a man, an obscene amount of music, jazz, all jazz stuff. And I didn't like the stuff. And I was 14, I discovered kind of rock and roll, and, uh, and the rest is history, you know? Right, so right. With, uh, and uh, where it was, Bands like, uh, I don't know, at the time, Genesis or Peter Gabriel or Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd. Were you listening to any other stuff, you know, before we got to the progressive? Right. Yeah. Were you listening to that kind of stuff? Um, I, I uh, well, like I said, I started with the Moody Blues and then that led yeah. to Genesis, yes, Jethro Tull, Kayak, um, Focus, um, Barkley James Harvest, Renaissance. Camel, oh. and uh, those were the band. I was I was just attracted to those kind of bands that were doing innovative wow. music, and and then some of that went into the soundtrack as well. You know, Tangerine Dream, and um, there was uh, I, th I think uh, William Friedkin used them on a on a few uh, on, a, on one of his films, and um, Goblin was another one that was doing some 
uh, soundtrack work. So I, it, it just all kind of all came together and made it, it there, there was the, this magical world of, of music that was out there where, where it just seemed like people were really into um, experimenting and uh, trying to just make rock music really uh, innovative and really amazing. Right. You could have stayed kind of in the film industry, you know, producing, recording, fixing videos, doing stuff for people mm -hmm. uh, and make a good living. But eventually it's like, well, I've been listening to all these progressive rock band. May, maybe I should put an album together, right? So uh, that's what's the, the beginning of Tales of Heroes and Lovers. So feel free to elaborate how the, the idea came, writing the track, finding a record label deal, and then put it out there. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I got it right. <laughs> yeah, this one right here. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's a beautiful. Yeah, um, that was um, what that album came out of frustration. I'll, I'll tell you what happened. Um, I was, uh, I was, I, I had gone to film school, so I was already working in the film industry. But I had this desire that I wanted to also try to put out music. Well, I wanted to to do both. And uh, at the time, unfortunately, this was the early 1980s, and I was writing these progressive rock, you know, epic pieces and trying to shop them around to different record companies, and nobody wanted them. They just, they, you know, at the time, uh, I think the Knack was the big band here in Los Angeles, and um, they just, they, they didn't, they weren't signing anything that was remotely progressive at all. And you had, in those days, this was pre-internet, you couldn't record your own stuff. You couldn't really put it out. You had to, you had to get a record deal and, um, and nobody wanted it, you know, and then it, there was disco and punk and new wave. And it just seemed like um, uh, nobody wanted my stuff. So I went ahead and recorded this myself <laughs> and just put it out myself. Um, and of course it didn't really do anything, but it was a good, it was a good learning experience. And I did do a, a music video for one of the songs, um, because I had access to all the film equipment that, that where, the, where I was working and, um, the, the, the video got played all over the place. It was on MTV and, wow. um, it, it, so it, it, it just seemed like, you know, uh, I was going to be destined to sort of combine music and film you know at some point <laughs> course, in my life right. but um yeah so that like i said that album came out of frustration i just i just couldn't i had to just do it myself because nobody else was well you know. were you know you were a musician for 16 years right for up till yeah. 15 where yeah. that was part of your life right so right. that doesn't go away right you were no. postpone, postponing the stuff a little bit but eventually uh, right you thought your head is a clash and say man yeah i like film score i do okay financially but i I really like music too, you know. So, right. I to, and MTV was, you know, the right place at the time to put it together. And then that I, I, I read that uh, that video got attention to um, different bands, and I think uh, Three Dog Night ended up calling you and saying, "Can you put something together for us?" Right? Yeah, yeah. Three Dog Night, which of course was a, a legendary band. Um, they they had just done some new recordings, and so I ended up uh, as one of my first directing jobs was directing their um, a music for, a music video for one of their songs. But that yeah, that resulted uh, from them seeing the uh, the uh, it's driving me crazy video from that album. Yeah, and then so music wise, did you now you were in great you know engaged with different you know people that were playing music and different rock band you had the opportunity to show your 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 first album around and say well not only i can do videos and, and and good quality videos but also i'm a musician you know would you like to listen to my yeah. stuff out there or do you have the opportunity to show your stuff around as well before you you move yeah. forward yeah I, I mean you have to understand during this whole time i'm i'm working full-time in the film business so the, the 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 music stuff was really on the side in free time and um, any any free time that I had. So I was I had this album finished. I was shopping it around, but as I told you, none of the record companies were really interested. I, although I did find one 
that it was a CBS affiliate that did like it, but they wanted me to record a new album. And I thought, well, this might actually be a, a, a big break here. So um, uh, I started recording uh, a project with another singer. And uh, we and we actually had gotten uh, Patrick Moraz to agree oh. to produce the album, you know, who was with, at the time he was with the Moody Blues. He had just been with the S. I thought, well, this is fantastic, you know. But that that whole thing kind of ended up falling apart as well, and um, but it, it for me I wasn't that frustrated about this because I like I said I was doing a lot of work at the film business and and things were going really well. Um, I was and and the whole music thing had always been like a sideline thing. So then, and then so they didn't want you to for for all, and then so so what what happened that then, then that became. The two album is not late for you, or it, there was a lot of time in between you before you put the, the second album together, or um yes, after the uh CBS project with um which was called Plan B uh fell apart. Um wonderful singer that I was working with, uh the Australian gentleman by the name of Chris Lloyds. He ended up going back to Australia. We broke up. Uh, it was just a, a du the two of us, it was a duo that they were going to try to promote us as. And um, so I joined up with another singer and we recorded uh, the It's Not Too Late album. Um, again, that was done independently. Um, but what, what that one did was a kind of a return to my more progressive roots. The Plan B project had been very, very pop oriented. They wanted hit singles. They want you know that was going to be a a, a pop act, <laughs> so I wasn't real happy with with the direction of the music, but um, yeah, we did the it's not too late thing and it and it uh, it came out as a C as the first CD that I had come out, and um, but again nothing happened with that so. <laughs> but if, then again another turn your life, if the, if that album the pop you know pop one would have been successful. Your yeah. life would have been, would have taken another path again. Right. You know, so right. if you, you know, if you, it's very easy to connect. It's very difficult to connect the dots going forward, but it's very easy to connect the dots, the dots going backward, right? Looking back. You're it's absolutely right. right. Yeah. In a way, you look back, you know, maybe at the at the time you were frustrated, but the best thing that happened to, to you in a way that that pop thing didn't work out because then you, you knew that that you wanted to do to stay in the progressive man, and as you were doing videos and progressive music, uh, you know, feel free to elaborate on how Camel came into your life. As, you know, that was well, exactly right. And I think you've, um, I, I think that what you're talking about is almost the secret of life. It's where uh, you can look back on things, and everything that happens is meant to be. Everything, absolutely, you know, absolutely, and. Um, and so I've always, and I've known that. So I've had an attitude of uh, if something doesn't work out, um, it, th well, there's a reason for that. And 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 inevitably, what does work out from that was the thing that was with the best possible option. So I don't get discouraged at all. I I, uh, I look at uh, everything. Everything that happens is is a purpose and leads to uh, dreams that. You may not have even met, you know, they're even better than you thought they would be <laughs> being fulfilled, you know. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited about the way life works like that. At least, you know, at least for me, that's how it works. And it's, I think we I should, I don't know if God exists or not, I way up to say that, but in a way, you know, connecting the dot, you know, and then a particular path close off and then you go into another path, you make turn make a left turn instead of making a right, perhaps that right. are the best issues. And the other thing that you need to be confident that things were going to work out. And you know I don't know if it happened to you, but in life many people wanna bring you down, right? Well yeah. forget about the music, stay in the classical oh, now you wanna do film and now you wanna start doing, you know, camel stuff and you know uh, you you People are crazy, you know. You know, you, you. I don't. In my case, I don't care what everybody else think or what everybody else does. Right. I, 
They right. say the voice inside myself, go for this, go for that, go for that. And uh, and you need to try, you need to do it. Otherwise, nobody, you know, will do it for you. You know, you don't want to live like life. Well, why didn't do this stuff? It was important for me at the time or whatever, you know, so. Right, right. No, I totally agree. Um, and uh, what, what you're talking about is, is really interesting because um, it was right after this point. In fact, it was the very next year that I got in touch with um, Andy Latimer from the band Camel, one of the best progressive bands from England. And um, they, you know, I, I started uh, producing and directing a, a lot of their uh, concert films and documentaries and DVDs for them. And that just opened up all kinds of doorways. And it, not only being an incredible amount of fun to do something like that, but to just uh, um, to be able to work with somebody who I admired oh, for yeah. so long. And um, it, yeah, that's that's been a, an amazing. And that was almost kind of the, the, the start of the fusion of, even though I'd done a few music videos for MTV and things, the, my relationship with Camel started the whole process of me working with um, some of these legendary bands that, uh, in terms of producing and directing their, their video output in concert films. Were you traveling a lot with them? I mean, Camel was playing every, you know, all over the world all the time. So it was, it was. We, we started off by doing things that were local. Like yeah. they, at the time they were, I was, I'm from Southern California and then they were actually based in Northern California. So, uh, I, the, the, the first show that we filmed was, was a show that they did in Los Angeles. Yeah. And that became the coming of age concert film. And then simultaneously we were doing the documentary uh, curriculum vitae, which uh, was, uh, which was a, the history of camel, which I love doing documentaries. I've done, yeah. you know, close to a hundred of them. And that one was just fantastic. And it was a very emotional film. Um, I, I don't know if you know much of Camel's story, but it's- yeah, No, I, I do, I do. I did have the opportunity to uh, talk to Colin Bass a couple of Oh weeks. yeah, wonderful guy. Yeah, amazing. Very nice person too. Man. Oh yeah, yeah, all those guys are. It's, um, uh, so that was amazing going up to their house. You know, I remember r rummaging through all of their, uh, they had, they brought down boxes and boxes of these old photos uh, that I had to sort through and scan them and to, to put into this documentary. And some of these had never been seen before. And it, you know, it, it just, you know, it was an amazing experience just to be up there with them working and then traveling and doing some of these shows with them. And then eventually, yeah, we did. Uh, I ended up doing, I think, a total of nine DVDs for them, which included going to Japan and right, yeah, yeah, doing all kinds of things. It was uh, what, what an amazing experience. Yeah, and it, it difficult to for you at the time. I, I assume that you were married, you had little kids to leave your family behind and and travel to all, all over the world. And, and well, uh, that, no, that one of my priorities was to stay with my family. So when I when I did go off it was only a very it's only for a few days i never i never went away i never went on a long tours or anything like that it would just be like go for a few days shoot the concert then come back yeah um, yeah I, I my family was more important than traveling that's right then <laughs> plus you have a you know nowadays well you, i don't know at the time you had a, a good studio at home but now nowadays you can go shoot and, and then come back home and then do all the all the work at home, right? You you really need to stay in Japan to edit and. Oh, exactly right. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it well, just the whole that's a whole another subject, and you're probably very familiar with this. It's just the whole transformation of uh, technology so, since I started. I mean, the, 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 the first thing I first movie I did was edited was on film. We shot it on film. You actually cut the film, you know, right. tape it back together, and and then it got, you know, then it went to video, and then it got computerized, and and the big studios that we used to have, right. are now I can do broadcast quality work like on a laptop, right, right here in front of me. It it's it's amazing how technology has just evolved over the years. Right. Yeah. So I have seen some of the videos 
And uh, well, I'm familiar with Camels. I have so I like so many bands, but Camel is it's an unbelievable band. I mean, yeah, Andrew Latimer is like a genius guy. I mean, he's some of those people that are way up there. And, uh, yes. No. And one of the other one of the other things about and Andy is that um, you know we all know some of the uh, the progressive bands that we love from the past, and some of their newer material didn't really measure up to some of their older material. Like you probably know who I'm talking about. Um, but Camel was somebody. I mean, his newer albums that he was putting out uh, when I started working with him with Dust and Dreams, Harbor Tears. Um, not in a wink. These albums were just as good as yes. the earlier albums. And here, here was a guy who was who had been around for such a long time and was still able to put that much effort into songwriting and to production just to to keep that uh, level of quality and magic going. I, I was I was very impressed with with Andy for sure. And you know they're going to be touring and starting. In Barcelona, and going to Spain, I think in March or April next year. They, yes, they mm -hmm. do some, and I think uh, Colin was telling me that there's a possibility they will start in Japan because they're so popular there, and then go back to Spain, and then we'll do some some gigs. They will do some gigs in Europe, and then I will I will go. Uh, I travel a lot for gigs myself. I mean, and music, as I told you before, is so important to me. So I see close to 40, shows, 40 50 shows a year. So I go everywhere, man. So wow, wow. And uh, especially where I live, since I live at the border with Maryland and um, Washington, every band come this way. So I'm very fortunate to be where I am. And, and uh, uh, did you ever work with Sky? Because people that like Camel like Sky as well. Are no, I haven't. Never, never they're, they're they're very good. Man. So feel so feel free to elaborate. So what happened all with all these um, DVDs that you mentioned? Um, they end up so they were part of you know they, once they were produced they, they were selling them they were to the website what was your exposure after after the, those DVDs were filmed uh, well I would um, yeah we'd finish them and we'd master them and then Camel yep. Productions had their own company and they would um, uh, distribute them you could get them off of their website see this was I started right before the internet happened with Camel. And originally they would sell stuff through a newsletter. And then as soon as the internet came along, they of course got rid of the newsletter and just were able to sell things directly over the, uh, off of their website. And then you could get them from Amazon. You could get, you could buy them at the shows. Um, it was a really good uh, way for people to uh, um, get, a, get a hold of these uh, concerts that they may have missed. Yeah, 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 gotcha. And then after that, you got your, you went back to film with the Joy Riders, correct? Sir? Yes, and and this is something most people don't know. I I tried to get, uh, I was hoping to get, uh, uh, Andy to score the movie, really? uh, and, and it was uh, they they actually approved him to score the movie, and for some reason at the last minute it 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 fell apart, um, and then uh, and I had written a song. At the theme song so they kept the theme song and used that in the movie but uh, that was a movie with uh, chris christopherson and, and martin Landau. and, uh, and uh, andy had really wanted to get into film scoring so i was trying to help try to make make that happen because i was the uh, second unit director on that movie but um and then the, the single it became popular i think right For, you know associated with the movie and it, it, it came out yeah that the song uh, so far from home came out as a single with a female singer on it yeah and then you um after that was you began working with andy and then in 2020 2010 you you put the, your your set album together right random acts of beauty was released right yeah that was that was the turning point was random acts of beauty it was um uh, I had been uh, speaking with Andy, and he had been um, he had been very very ill, um, very serious illness, and he was recovering from that. And you know, I I had talked to him, and I and he he was very encouraging to me. He said, "Dave, just he knew I had a musical background. I hadn't been exploring it 
for 14, 15 years by that point. Um, and uh, he, he just said, Dave, just, just do it. Just record an album. Just go ahead and do it. You know, and, and this was at the time when, you know, when computers, they had this, you know, pro, pro tools had come out, you could actually record in your own home and not have to spend, you know, three or $400 an hour like you had, you had to do in the old days when I first started recording. You could actually do it yourself on your, uh, on your computer, which was, you know, amazing. So I recorded um, one song and it was a song called Masquerade. And I sent it to Andy just to see what he thought about it. And he offered to play on it. He offered to, oh, wow. Which, which was like, okay, that's fantastic. And, and as soon as he said that, I knew I had to now finish the album and do, you know, make, you know, do something with this because this, this was an amazing turn of events here. And, um, I, I still remember the day he uh, he sent me the um, he recorded a guitar solo for it and uh, when I got he sent this was a new thing for me to do as well which was sending files over the internet back and forth you know I would send him the track and then he sent me back his guitar solo and I I sunk it up with the track when I got when I got it and I was just blown away. I, I can't even tell you how magical that that sounded, and um, and then the next day he he kept sending me more tracks. He sent, in fact, he sent whole more sections, and then he sent me a vocal, he, him singing, and I, I was just blown away by the, how involved he got in this. And you have to remember he hadn't he hadn't recorded anything for eight years um, because he had been recovering from this illness, and for for him to put this effort into this thing for me was just, I, I, I was so appreciative of it, you know, and that changed, that changed everything right there. Um, my son and I recorded the rest of the album, he and I together. My son at the time was 20 years old yep. and uh, he was a great guitar player, really good guitar player. So I did the keyboards and the bass and uh, he did the guitars and um, it was a very small production and so we, we had we, we recorded the rest of the album and so then we had this album finished which was very easy to record and it came out uh, I think in October of 2010 and it just it just took off I mean it was it was amazing I, I couldn't believe it I, I didn't know if people would like it I didn't know if people were even interested in progressive rock at this point um, I, I did you know because I hadn't been following it been so long since I'd actually done anything. I hadn't really been following the musical tr trends, but apparently progressive rock had made a resurgence, you know, with bands um, like, you know, whatever bands were, were coming out at that time. Uh, and um, oh, it, uh, what, what was your idea to tour with the band or you were happy with just releasing it to the public and see how sales would go and make a little yeah. bit of money for I, I was open to touring, it, yeah. but um, it, it what happened, what, what always seems to happen is I got really busy uh, <laughs> in the film business and, and I had to make a, a choice. Uh, it, it just, um, and some of the stuff I was doing in the film business was very exciting. Yeah. Um, and I, it just, it just never seemed to be, there, there was never a time. So I still haven't toured yet. <laughs> Ever since I've sort of gotten back into the music business, a lot of people would like me to, but I just I'm busier now than, than ever. So I I don't know how that's going to come about. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe one day. Well, you, yeah. it's a good problem to have, though. You know, if you're making yeah. money and you you have work and you're busy, that's 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 good for you. And yeah. then you, and then some year later, you, you know, you begin doing collaborate with Hayward again. Uh, and that, in a way, really reach, reach like a new level, and then uh, you know, feel free to elaborate on how the 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 devotion picture called the Win of Heaven came about, and so forth. Yeah. So, um, what happened after the after um, Random Acts of Beauty came out? Uh, I uh, I was thinking, well, this is great. I can now, you know, if I don't have time to tour, at least I can re start recording albums on a regular basis now. But then I 
I started working um, with uh, Justin Hayward, who was the guy who originally inspired me to go into the music business in the first place back in when I was a you know 13 year old kid <laughs> and um I, I I we shot one of his um I filmed one of his concerts actually uh the booking agent for the Moody Blues was familiar with the work that I had done for Camel wow. so they had, they had seen the, the Camel videos and were impressed by them and asked me to do something with the Moody Blues and we ended up doing a Justin Hayward solo show which was titled Spirits Live, which we filmed in Atlanta. Yep. And um, now by this time, my family was all grown. And so I could now travel freely. And um, and so we we I followed Justin on his, the, the last part, of, it was his first solo tour. And, um, or, or one of his, it was his first tour that he had done um, as kind of an acoustic act. And uh, so I was able to follow him from Washington, D.C. all the way down to Atlanta and film a lot of the behind the scenes things. And then we filmed the, the very last show of the tour in Atlanta. And that became the Spirits Live Blu-ray. And it also became a, a PBS television special. Um, and um, and then I did a documentary on the, the, the behind the scenes of the, you know, on the road for the tour. And... Um, and then things just got crazy after yeah. that, you know. I mean, if you do a BBS documentary and behind the scenes and playing with Hayward and uh, that, if you were busy before, now you became very, very busy. Oh, that now was, you that know, was insane. You know, yeah. Now you need a secretary to answer your email. Like <laughs> yes. Picking up the phone because, you know, so you were busier than ever. But, you know. Yeah, we did. Um, well, because it was picked up by PBS, the PBS television network, they wanted uh, some more videos that they could uh, use in their fundraising. Um, so I, I did two more videos for Justin Hayward. Um, and those had to come out very, very quickly. We did a documentary, which won an award on the sort of the history of Nights in White Satin, his classic song, and another concert video. And, um, and then we, he wanted to do another video after that. We shot another concert in uh, Florida uh, the following year. And that was at the time when we were getting ready to do this. Um, we're in the planning stages of doing a movie called The Wind of Heaven, which, which is it's the Justin Hayward Wind of Heaven. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I had, um, you know, started writing a song for the theme for this movie, and Justin agreed to to, to co-write it with me and then perform it, and he recorded it, and and then that song got put onto the the Florida concert DVD, and we did a very elaborate music video for that for that song as well, and we had a world premiere of it in Boston. It was just it was just one thing after another. Um, but but Justin, it was an amazing, amazing man, just wonderful man. I mean, you, well, you can tell by the types of songs that he writes. You know what a wonderful guy, what a wonderful heart he has. And um, a, a person who writes that type of music cannot be a bad, or you know, a bad person, right. arrogant person, or whatever. Right. So, right. So it takes a special person to write special songs. Like, I suppose you know. Well, you know, I'll tell you what. You run the risk uh, when you're when you end up meeting or work. In my case, meeting and working with your heroes, you run the risk of them maybe not being the type of person you thought that they were. <laughs> you know, but I can I can honestly say that both Andy Latimer and Justin Hayward were, um, and now Steve Hackett and other people I'm working with. All of these people are just amazing people. They're just and and. Uh, Alan Parsons is just, I'm just, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm very lucky that the people that I admired when I was a kid yeah, yeah. all turned out to be wonderful people. <laughs> I know, I know exactly, I know exactly when, what you mean. And uh, yeah, with Steve Hackett, and um, I remember during the pandemic, I was putting the rain together and I began calling people. Nobody was replying back. And I, I changed a couple of email with Steve Hackett. And I said, well, I want to do something, something good in the world. Let me let me put it to you this way. 
and uh, you know, I own all the music that I play on the radio. I pay music rights uh, to to organization United States. Um, I it's not bootleg. I own the stuff because I have good collection. I want to put like a nice interface. I would never charge a penny for any of the radio. I would never have an advertisement on the radio. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be 24 hour day. So whether you are in Tokyo or in Buenos Aires, Argentina, you can listen to good music in any of the radios. Um, I'm broadcasting a better quality of Spotify. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I want to start interviewing with people. And he said, well, you pay for everything. What's, what, what's the catch here? No, there's no catch. I right. do it because that's my my passion, my part-time job. I have right. a well paid job during the day and I and I, I wanted to do it to create in a way a music legacy. At the time he he was my first interview and I said, okay, let's go for it. Yeah. And then uh, and then I don't know what the second, but the third interview was with another guy from Genesis, used to be with Genesis before Steve was uh Anthony Phillips. Oh yes. Uh -huh. And then number four was Annie Haslam. I right. see a nice poster that you have here. Uh, the rest is history. I can lag it on the way. At the beginning, I thought, man, these people wouldn't, they wouldn't be able perhaps to understand the accent of this or that and because I don't play an instrument and uh, I don't know how to read music, but I was prepared for the interview and I can lag it on the way. Uh, the rest is history. You know, I, I well, you're, it, people like yourself, you know. So Your interviews are fantastic. I mean, you're Thank definitely, you. You, know, you know what you're talking about and you have a feel for the, the you oh, can tell yeah. you, 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 you music. I, I, have, I have a passion for music. Yeah. As I mentioned many, many times before, I, 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 this is like therapy for me. I really like doing stuff. I, yeah. um, I'm not a musician, but I don't know. I've been listening to music three, four hours a day for the last 50 years. So I have a, and I have a wide range of stuff that I like. Right. It, it's, I do that because there is a passion, right? Sometimes you need to do stuff at your job because your boss tells you to do it. But music is my own time. I can do whatever I want. And uh, the other day, I ended up having an interview with someone, at, uh, people from Dead Can Dance at four o'clock in the morning. And mm -hmm. my wife told me, are you nuts? Why are you waking up? <laughs> well, because I, want, I need to call Lisa Gerard from Dead Can Dance. Who is she? Well, she didn't understand who she was. And <laughs> I, was so, I was so happy to call her at four o'clock in the morning. I don't know. Or some people sometimes, <laughs> I call people in, in Japan at 3 o'clock in the morning or 12 or whatever the time. And right. I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky to do this stuff, man. So I'm very happy. So then then after that, the, your fourth album came about, right? The, the Sound of Dreams, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so, yeah. And, and during this whole time I was working with um, Justin Hayward, I was trying to yeah. get the album going. And it was just it was just so and there were so many other projects as well it just was it was very difficult um to get it going and it was is it, it unlike the first unlike random acts of beauty the sound of dreams was a very difficult album to do because random acts was very simple it was just me and my son in my in our little studio and with and then andy sending me his tracks uh, and that was it um this album had all these guests guest appearances on it and it was recorded in a bunch of different studios and it's very hard to coordinate it and plus i was far more busy now than i was before <laughs> so it was a very difficult album to get, try to get it finished um but it, it turned out wonderful and uh and it just it just kind of snowballed um there was the the song that um that justin and i had recorded the wind of heaven now that song had already appeared on Justin's Greatest Hits album all the way, but we had a different version of it that was longer that uh, he allowed me to go ahead and put on this album, The Sound of Dreams. And then from there, it just it just snowballed. I asked Steve Hackett, who I had met a number of years earlier, if he'd like to play it, and he said, sure. And then um, uh, there was a drummer by the name of Jeff O'Keefe who um, who knew Annie Haslam. And so he put me in touch with Annie Haslam and I asked her if she wanted to appear on it and she said yes. And then she introduced me to Billy Sherwood, you know, the bass player for Yes and who had replaced Chris Squire. And Billy actually lives not too far, you know, in Southern California here. So we hit it off really well and um, Billy agreed to be on the album as well. And it just... And I'm thinking, what 
how is this all coming together? You, how you can't plan something like this. Of course, uh, yeah. Who's yeah. going to have? Who can get Justin Hayward and Steve Hackett to be on the same album, right? And um, but the music was such that I think it really appealed to all, all of these people because I these are the people that I'd been inspired by and I'd grown up with. Renaissance was one of my favorite bands. You know, Genesis was Moody Blues were, and you could tell that there was inspiration on each of the tracks for those particular artists um that they were that they were appearing on and so the the track with annie haslam sounds like a renaissance track the, the thing that billy plays bass on sounds like a yes track you know and and then by this time um and we had met uh, i had met alan parsons now I, i'd known alan parsons a while i'd actually met him before i had started working with justin hayward but now we were working with Alan Parsons and that just, if, if I thought I was busy before, <laughs> it just went crazy. And, um, but his lead singer, uh, PJ Olson, who's been with Alan Parsons for 20 years, he's is the lead vocalist, agreed to, uh, to sing on the album as well. He's got this amazing voice and he did this amazing vocal arrangement for the song that he appears on, on the album. And that got released as the first single and the first video from the album. Um, I, I have seen the I have seen some of the videos and I saw, you know, as I was preparing for this interview, I listened to your album on Spotify. They're very very good. I mean, obviously you are like a, you know, like a Chilean wine because I'm from Chile. And I want to use an example. Uh, it, you're getting better over time, man. I mean, it's from you know from playing yeah. piano. Well, thank you. you know, at 15 years old to now, all the people that you have worked for album and all the man that you associated with, the people that you hang out with, it's amazing. You know, have you you ever thought that, about that stuff? You ever, you know, wake up, you know, look at the sun in Southern California, drink a beer or a glass of wine and say, look at my life, man. I was this and look at where I am right now. You know, it, 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 you know what? It's been a progression. And and I'm at the point, I think you've, you've touched on it before, where... Um, and it was one of the things that I wanted to put into this album, The Sound of Dreams, which was the theme that dreams can happen. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. I mean, not. I used to tell people, you know, yes, go after your dreams, but within reason, you know, make sure they're not something crazy, you know, that, that's not going to, that's impossible to have. Now, I, I've thrown that out the window. No, go for whatever you, I mean, whatever you can dream. I think can happen. I mean, it, and it, you almost have to have an attitude of gratefulness for when the things start to come together and you have to just kind of relax about it. If I don't even try to make this stuff happen anymore and it just keeps more stuff keeps happening and more dreams keep getting fulfilled. There's a, um, there's a line in a song written by a 19 year old British lad named Justin Hayward the name of the song is Nights and White Satin. And the line in the song is, just what you want to be, you will be in the end. Okay? It's, just kind, of, it's kind of a throwaway line in that song. Because most people think that that's kind of just a love song. But um, it's a very powerful line. Just what you want to be, you will be in the end. And in this al album, uh, uh, Sound of Dreams here, there's a song on here called uh, Hold Back the Rain. And I did a variation on that line which is um whatever we choose we can achieve that's right. and that line and that's what i wanted this album to be is to inspire people to to follow their dreams because they 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 happen and and i and i can't explain why but it's uh it's it's what makes life just amazing amazing to me you know i'll tell you a little bit of story about myself and uh I was a I was a rebel. I was a terrible kid. Bad grades. My parents were both professional, well known in Chile, and uh, and I was I don't know chasing girls and drinking beers when I was seventeen. I wanted to listen to bands, and uh, and uh, you know bands were not touring Latin America, so I was going crazy, you know. And I said, man, Dad, I really want to listen to music. I said, well, what make you feel that will help you to go to United States to study? If you have terrible grades, you will never make it. If you finish high school, we'll be very happy, you know. Yeah. Now, 36 years I've been here in the United States, it's 86. So, 
uh, 38 years later, I have six six college degrees. Right. <laughs> I went to Harvard. I have two master's degrees from Harvard. Wow. I went to University of Illinois, one of the best engineering school. I went to uh, University well, of Virginia. Congratulations. I'm, I'm taking classes at MIT now. I, I own four radio wow. stations. Uh, I, I talk to great people like yourself. Uh, I work for a great company. I'm in the process of moving in another consulting stuff to do financial instrument analysis, which I have done well. So wow. I'm, when the people talk about the American dream, I mean, I'm the American dream alive, man. That's, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm an average guy with an accent who made it happen. Well, yeah, it's true. I work harder than anybody else. I'm very persistent, consistent, work hard. If I have an idea, I will make it happen. I, it's, right. not, it's not easy for me to give up. So, you know, in this country, people complain about this president, that president, man. If I did it, anybody could, you know. So, uh, you know, could do it and stuff. So it's, you need well, to do it. Thank yeah. you, thank you. So I don't and know. the thing about, you know, yes, you do have to work hard. Absolutely. But if, it's, if, it's Absolutely. A, if it's a passion, you don't care. It does, it oh. comes natural to you. So um, it's not just stuff comes to you. You do have to work for it. But right. if it's, pa if you're passionate about it, you, you know, what else are you going to do? You can't, you can't not do it, right? That's right. And you evolve, <laughs> you evolve over time. You, you adjust, right? Like the yeah. first album to the second album. Well, maybe I didn't like that. I didn't have a studio. My song was learning how to play, whatever, right? And then from the second to the third, or your videos became better. Or that, the same with me. At, at the beginning, I didn't know what, how, what question to ask. Steve Haggett or the first five interviews, I wasn't prepared enough. But, you know, you learn the process. You did what people ask you. They have people have seen the interviews and they know what I'm about. I have an axe or whatever, and they become easier. They become easier. They become easier. So now I'm more comfortable trying to get a hold of I don't know Alan Parsons or Rick Wakeman or whatever. I want to interview all of them, right. and, uh, and and I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm very happy that I do stuff. And, and believe it or not, I don't. Somebody told me a good something the other day. Say, so I it's like an ego thing or. In a way, it's just the ego is still there, but I'm putting the stuff out there for other people to benefit. Like I would right. have said, right? Lisa, okay. Lisa Gerard, right? She rarely does interview. And I, I got lucky that I was able to call her in Australia four o'clock in the morning. And now I uploaded the video to the radio and YouTube. And now over 2,000 people have seen it. Have right. seen the 30, 28 minute interview I did to her, you know? That, so I helped, you know. 2,000 people, you know, so I'm very Oh, happy. you're right. Yeah, you're bringing joy to people's lives, you know. And, Absolutely, and, and man. That's, Absolutely. that's what these albums do. You know, I love doing it, but other people love listening to it. So it, you're helping other people, you know. And then uh, Alan Parson came into your life. That's a big deal, man. That was, a big, that was a big change. Miracle after miracle. You need to write like a... Like a book, man, about you know, miracle, <laughs> miracle can happen by day. Uh, you have no idea. Yeah, it's, there's, there's, there's... A lot more that you're not aware of, <laughs> but yeah, Alan Parsons came in uh, to my life. Um, it, it like I, I think I mentioned at the beginning of this interview, we back in uh, 2019. It's it started getting. Uh, he had uh, we went on tour with him. Basically, we went to yeah. Europe. Uh, we filmed <laughs> two, two show. We filmed a show in Amsterdam, another one in Utrecht, and then we filmed another one in Tel Aviv with an 80 piece orchestra, and we had this uh, crew. That we used uh, in Amsterdam. That was um, we were able to use like twenty four cameras, which was unprecedented for a concert video, and uh, film this film these amazing shows. And um, the, the the concert video is just I think it's some of my best work. I have a partner in Trinity Houston who co produces and co directs everything with me, and it's just the, the way things turned out. It was just fantastic. And, you know, Alan, of course, has a reputation of, of extreme high quality work that he does in audio. And the fact that I was able to match that with my video work was was great. I mean, I, I wasn't sure whether my work was going to be good enough for him. <laughs> you know? Were you nervous about that? Or? No, not, you, really, really not, really. Really. not really. But I wanted I wanted it to be good. Um, but the fact that he was impressed enough by it and, and loved putting putting everything out was was just great and then again we just continued to work more and more together we we'll do and we've got some some stuff that just came out um where i um uh, i wrote a song that he that he wanted to put on his new album which just came out 
And um, yeah, I, I, I heard about, yeah, I have that album and, uh, and uh, I listened to that. I think you're referring to the song that was called, I think, it, I Won't Be Led Astray, I believe. Yes, called. I Won't Be Led Astray. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's beautiful, man. It's very good quality. I mean, like, I can tell you, I, I listened to many, many, many bands and that's, you know, I recognize with quality work, man. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was, I mean, to have one of your songs produced by Alvin Parsons and included on his album. And then we ended up shooting the video for this song um, with uh, Alan wanted to bring in David Pack, his old friend from Ambrosia. Now you remember uh, Alan engineered the very first Ambrosia album back in 1975. And then um, they played, Ambrosia actually played on the first Alan Parsons project album on uh, Tales of Mystery and Imagination. And then uh, David Pack uh, did some more recording with Alan on the Try Anything Once album. Yeah. And so this was a kind of a reunion between Alan and David. So I was up there with the with the film with the film crew, you know, to get this reunion and to shoot the music video in Alan's studio up there in Santa Barbara. For so and again, it's all of this stuff is just so surreal, you know, to be able to here they are, these legends, you know, recording one of my songs. It's going to go on his album and then come out as a single. I mean, it's just, I, did, I don't did, know how to explain did, did you ever ask yourself, maybe I'm dreaming. I, I don't want to wake up, but <laughs> you know, like, it's like a miracle. But anyway, so, you know, maybe this is like a dream and I want to wake up and you would be. Well, I, <laughs> I, have to, I have to tell you something. My whole life's kind of been like this. And let me give you another example from a long, long time ago. I was working on a movie called The, the Passion of the Christ, with uh, which Mel Gibson was doing. Oh, that's a piece of, yeah, that's a beautiful. It, yeah. We were we were filming it in, uh, I was on the, we were filming it in Rome. And uh, the, what they had done is they'd taken the, uh, we were filming it on the Chinachita studio lot. And they had built a, a replica of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, on this movie lot and the walls were like 30 40 feet high so you couldn't see it blocked out the rest of the studio and the rest of the city so when you were on the set it felt like you were um you had kind of gone back in time uh especially there was i remember there was one day when we were filming and um they had 500 extras they were in this one scene and they were all dressed in the costumes of first century, uh, first century Jerusalem. <laughs> and um, I had my back to all the camera equipment and the lights. And, and all I could see was the, the people, the extras and the set, which just engulfed everything. And it was so surreal. It literally felt like, uh, like I had been transported back in time until uh, a centurion walked by on a cell phone and then suddenly oh, <laughs> I was cool. snapped back into reality again but for that brief moment it felt like a dream you know it felt like I knew I was awake but it felt like I was dreaming and that's the way a lot of this stuff happens for me it's just it's been one one events like this over and over again where um I know I'm I know I'm awake <laughs> but it just doesn't seem it doesn't seem like it Maybe you should look into what they're called lucid dreaming. Yes, lucid I, well, dream. I know about lucid dreaming. <laughs> yeah, there's like a dream within a dream, you know. So the music, the the, the movies, unbelievable. Yeah, I know. It's, I have seen the movies all the time, and the soundtrack is unbelievable too. You yeah. know, somehow Mel Gibson, I think, got like a bad rap. He makes some comment about this or that. Who I am to criticize, but uh, he's a very good person for what I heard. Of course, I never met the guy, but I don't know. Something. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's it it's a it's. I mean, everybody has opinions. I I can vouch for the fact that he's he's a very nice person. I, I just had lunch with him a couple of weeks ago, and he's um, he's not what I think a lot of people try to portray him to be. He you know he's human, but he's he's a, he's well, a great, great artist. He knows his craft. Oh, he, very good. Yeah. Oh my, he he is one amazingly talented filmmaker. That's for sure. And are you a, are you a religious person at all, or I don't know if you follow any? Well, I, I try to keep, I mean, you can tell, you can tell by my music that there's a, like maybe a spiritual element to the music or the melodies. You can, you can kind of tell that, um, you know, I try to, I, I, I try to weave uh, inspiring 
I try to be inspiring with my writing and I try to, um, um, I just, I, I really would like, I don't, I don't want to do anything that um, has a negative impact on people. Yeah. If that makes sense, you know. So I, I try to be very careful with my. I feel I have a responsibility with my writing, and I want to be able to on the projects that I do that um, um, that I don't want to leave a negative impact on yeah. this world. You know. A good question. I'm going to be seeing Roy Water on Tuesday, and when I have seen Roy Water. Many times, of course, he's a very well-known person, and and the band where he's coming from is very. What's what's your take on musician taking politics into the show? And what what what's your take? That should should they do it? Should, shouldn't do it? I don't know. What what do you think about it? I I have mixed feelings about it. I I try not to. Um, um, I I I I don't. For me, I don't like to say anything publicly yeah. about that because I just want people to enjoy the music. And I don't want to, I want, I have fans completely across the board and, and everybody. I mean, I would, I love, I, I love all people. And I just, I don't, um, I, I don't feel for me that I want to bring any kind of a political message to, to anything that I do in yeah. regards to promoting the music or anything like that having said that i think people should have the freedom to do whatever they want to do i don't i don't believe in restricting people if they want to speak out that's that's great if they don't then that's great you know for me somehow i don't know they shouldn't mix i mean if you go and see a show it should be about the music and about pink floyd and the heats not putting political it should be up to the individual who attend the show Right. You understand, well, you are old enough to, well, you like this person, you don't like the person, you like politics, what are you doing to change anything about it? Right. Well, but he happens to be in a position where, because he's a well-known person, you know, uh, to do that kind of stuff. But I had mixed feelings about that stuff. Well, know? I had, I mean, we just had a kind of a, I, I wasn't involved in this, but I was around it when it was happening. Um, we did the, you know, we should, uh, we filmed this concert with Alan Parsons in Tel Aviv yeah. at, uh, with the Israeli, with the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. Just yeah. an absolutely gorgeous sound and show and everything. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And, and as you know, Roger Waters from Pink Floyd was trying to discourage Alan from playing that show. And it was, um, and Alan just said, look, Music, music can bring people together. Just you mm -hmm. can't restrict. We'll, we'll we'll play for anybody. You know, it doesn't. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be limiting where music goes. Um, and so, you know, I can understand people's feelings about things, but it's. Uh, I I I think it's best. I think your your attitude. I think is the best best way. Just let people enjoy the music. That's right. Well, if you know, look at. I don't know what music come from or what it is, but it, for me, it takes me places. You know, I put my yeah. headphone, I drink a beer or whatever, and I go places with music, whether right. it's your type of music or other other band music, right? because I listen to a lot of stuff. And uh, uh, it can bring happiness to me. I, I don't know. Look at look at the mess in Ukraine. You know, if, if it were to me, I will bring a lot of records and CDs to put in and say, okay, Please listen to four hours of the stuff, man. And yeah. <laughs> chill out. Yeah. Rethink, chill out. Rethink about what you're doing. Or, yeah. You know, killing people or this or that. It's, it's crazy. We need it crazy. More people need good music. I, 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 that's my my motto, you know. Oh, no, you're right. The, the, yeah. the, the world can be a better place, you know. It's yeah. Crazy. You know, it's crazy that, you know, who, who really the water is telling Alan Parsons that he could not, you know, turn to Tel Aviv because maybe... I don't know, he's, well, I don't know, I don't want to say this in, on, on the recording, but it's, uh, it's, music can really bring happiness, man, and, uh, yeah, you know, it's a beautiful, where do you think, um, I mean, you have done great stuff, and you have worked with so many famous people, and you've been very lucky, very fortunate to do well in your life and everything, you know, fall into place, 
looking back at your life, anything you could have done differently or? No, I, I, I think everything that's happened has led exactly where it should. Yeah. So, like I said, that's why I wasn't, even though I may have been discouraged back in 1982 when I was trying to get a record deal and they were telling me no, that was the right thing that happened back then. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, no, I, I wouldn't have done anything differently. Um, everything's where it should be right now. Exactly. You know, as a, as a producer and all the people that you were aware, you think that in general, uh, how is, what does it take to survive in, in the music businesses? Besides, you know, hard work and dedication and what other... Oh, see, no, I, don't know. Know. I, I don't know. See... Um, you did it. <laughs> well, but I'm not making a living doing music, you see. Oh, I, yeah. And that's a that's a big thing because music is a passion. You know, would, would I, if I had... If I had been a musician as my profession, would I have had to compromise the style of music that I write in order to make a living at it? And I don't think I could have done that. I don't think I could, because the whole, the whole reason for being or enjoying a certain style of music is to get that emotional feeling you get from it. So when it becomes necessary to do something outside of that um, in order to make a living, I think is would have been difficult. So I'm very fortunate. In film, I don't care because there's so many different aspects of filming I can do and enjoy all of that. But with music, there's a certain passion about it that I, I wouldn't been able to compromise. So I don't know how to, I wouldn't know how to tell anybody how to make a living in music these days because I don't know, I don't know where the, the money comes from, you know. Any, any person, you have, you know, you have worked with so many great musicians that you couldn't ask for anything more in life but any any particular band any particular musician that you would like to work with in, in a year from now two years from now man i, I wish i could, one day i had to work with x y or c or... well that's you um, if, if you say here we come true because knowing you you know <laughs> You give me uh, a name, I, and then people will call you in a couple of days. You know, or, or... I, I'd have to tell you, my first choice, my first choices would have been Justin Hayward, Steve Hackett, Alan Parsons, Andy Latimer, and Annie Haslam. Okay, and I've already done those, so I don't know where else to go from this point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, there's there's a lot of people I admire. Tom Sherpetseal from from Kayak. Um, John Lee's from Barclay James Harvest. I mean, there's there's some there's some people I love. I love the band uh, Carnatica. I love uh, the the band Moon Safari. These are I I just met the guys from Moon Safari recently, and these are amazing musicians. And um, so we'll see we'll see where this goes. <laughs> what are you working nowadays? And uh, what what is on your on your desk on your computer? What what if you can? I I, I have a mo I, there's a movie I'm going to be doing. Um, it's a romantic comedy I'm going to be working on later this year. And then um, I'm doing some recording as well. And uh, got some, a few ideas. I'm, I'm talking to Justin Hayward and Alan Parsons about a few ideas. Um, so we'll see what happens. But lots of stuff. I mean, I'm, no, it's not going to let out. <laughs> I'm never going to have time to write that book, right? <laughs> well, you, you need to hire somebody to write for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, if you don't have the time to, man, I will hopefully I, that's the, the last question that I have. And you do it so well, man. I'm, I'm lucky that I had the opportunity to talk to you. Have your your life is not my life like a miracle. So it hopefully is one day I will be able to visit you, uh, you know, in, in California and then we can get a bite to eat. I would love that. And, 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 uh, and, uh, you know, and definitely all the people that I will send you a separate email because. There's a lot of people that I would love to interview. So if you can put me in touch with, you know, sure. I, if I were to you talk to that person, I will put you in touch with that because for me, as I said before, I, I'm doing this as a passion. And if if I create like a musical legacy, as somebody told me on the on, on the radio or or in YouTube for other people to listen to them and can put up with my accent or whatever. And uh, yeah. that, that's I'm, I'm happy to do that. But this gives me a lot of satisfaction for me, believe it or not, man. So well, thank you, thank you for uh, for reaching out, and I enjoyed talking to you. And you're very good at what you do, so keep it, keep going, keep doing thank it. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. Have a great. All right, for you, man. Thank All right, you. you too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Right.